Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Malarkey. I'm a partner at SW. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to our Spotlight Wine Tourism webinar today. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. And we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. The easing of COVID restrictions and return of customers and visitors is a hot topic for the wine tourism sector. And I'm pleased to be joined by our experts, Michael, Sam and Robin, and our moderator, Mark, to discuss how best to prepare for this and maximize the opportunity, the expected release of this pent up demand will create for your businesses. We're really excited to be able to bring these leading experts to you today to discuss this topic. Now, before we start, there are some housekeeping matters to attend to. Uh, we recommend you click on the enter full screen button to maximize your uh, webinar experience. It's located on the top right hand corner of your screen. If you have a question to ask, please do so through the Q&A function and the button at the bottom of your panel. We'll endeavor to answer your question uh, during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation, or we will answer subsequent to the webinar finishing. We will also be running a poll question today, which should be popping up on your screen just about now. Um, once you've answered that question, the, the pop-up will disappear and it, it's accessible uh, through the polling button at the bottom of the screen if you wish to return to that question. We'll share the results towards the end of the session. Now with the housekeeping done, I'd like to introduce Mark O'Callaghan. He's the Managing Director at Wine Networking Consulting and he's been with Wine Networking since 2013. Uh, after working as a senior winemaker for one of the largest Australian wine companies. He works with wine businesses across Australia and around the world, including China and England, with earlier projects in India and the Canary Islands. Mark is on the management, management committee and a past president of the Yarra Valley Wine Growers Association. He is a regular wine judge at both the capital city and regional shows, occasional author and lecturer, member of the Victorian Pinot Noir Workshop Committee and former chair of committee for the Yarra Valley Wine Show and James Halliday Chardonnay Challenge. So he likes to keep himself busy. So welcome, Mark. Uh, we're really excited to be hosting this webinar with Wine Consulting today. Thanks, Tom. Um, we're quite excited about this one too. We think this is, you know, there's almost nothing more relevant to the wine world at the moment. We're looking to bring together some speakers who could really help us maximize the long run value of this pent up travel demand, make it more than just a sugar rush. So our first speaker is uh, Michael Whitehead from the ANZ. Um, Michael's the head of agribusiness there and some really interesting bio notes on Michael. We're very lucky to have him here today. As the head of food and bev and agribusiness insights for ANZ, uh, Michael focuses on mapping industry-based trends and analysing the impact of these sexual changes and dynamics on stakeholders across the agribusiness sector. Prior, he worked for Macquarie Agricultural Funds Management in New York, Rabobank's Food and Agribusiness Advisory Team in North America, as well as the UN and the International Committee of the Red Cross in Switzerland. Uh, he's been featured widely in global media outlets, including CNBC, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal. He's been in agricultural production and consulting, primarily in Australia and China. He has a BA from La Trobe University, an MBA from the Melbourne Business School and the Rotterdam School of Management. He's completed the Harvard Business School Advanced Agribusiness course. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and I will now try going across to some slides here. And hopefully, is, is that all right, colleagues? Can you see my opening slide? You, you can indeed. Thank you very much. Look, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, let's make a date. Let's, in about six months, all do this again in person, somewhere in Mark's part of the world, I'm going to nominate. Uh, Mark can choose the wines and, and we can have a great discussion about this fantastic industry. Now, I know that I have 10 minutes to talk, so I have way too many slides for that. What I'm uh, really looking forward to talking with you all about today now and in the questions and answers um, 
uh, are almost more questions uh, about where consumers will go with wine, things impacting the sector, what people are buying, what they, why they're doing it as well, uh, and then things to think about. And then we can come back after this, as I say, in Q&A or even later uh, to some of the things that uh, we'd like to talk about to help everybody's businesses. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's a fascinating and terrific industry, but it is all about how can everybody succeed in it going forward. And Sam and Robin uh, particularly have some terrific things things to, to say after me as well. Uh, in a nutshell, I, I, I'd like to throw a challenge to you all, first of all. And in my role, where me and the team cover all agribusiness, always treat yourself as an economic experiment. Um, we do this with meat a lot. Why is it when you get to the supermarket that you choose a particular kind of meat, or you buy more, or you buy less, and then times that by five or 10 million, that's where the industry is going, that's what's going to impact companies. Now, if we're in the wine industry, or if you are particularly, it can be hard to separate yourself out there from the people who live in the burbs uh, and what they're doing, but always look at your own behaviour and re replicate it, and, and why are the people around you doing what they're doing? Before we, we get on to the particular slides today uh, and in trying to go forward, um, I, I'd also like to just sort of throw two points up about my involvement in wine. And Mark, thank you much for very much for the intro. Uh, and to make myself a, a bit of a, a suburban inv uh, involvee in the wine industry. Uh, one, and I haven't told the other people on the, uh, on the call this, I won the wine raffle at Heidelberg Primary School last year when it was still allowed to have a fate. And what that involved was every parent at Heidelberg Primary being ordered to give a bottle of wine to the school uh, to then have the prize for the raffle. So downstairs from here, I have 300 of the most reluctantly given under $10 bottles you could ever come across. Um, so I'm just not sure when we're going to drink them, but that's once again part of the industry. The second part, and I have told my colleagues, uh, my friends, this it's, it's an interesting one. In 1997, I was working in China in agriculture and a part of that in the wine sector way out west. I brought back a box of wine to Australia, a Great Wall, Dynasty, some French Chinese joint venture wine. I was told at Australian Customs I'd have to pay duty on it when they learned it was Chinese wine. Uh, they told me not to worry and just bring it through. It's been sitting in my cellar for 24 years now. I haven't touched it. I'm almost scared to go near it, but I've now been told by some Chinese friends in the wine industry that they will pay me very well for it uh, because it now has historical value. I still don't know if the corks in it will ever come out. So... Let's look at a number of points on the wine industry. I'll touch on these briefly. So, and you're welcome to read these afterwards. Everybody take the presentation, come back to me. Some of these points apply to the whole industry, but want to come back to the consumer point. Can't talk about Australian wine without talking about the impact of Chinese wine tariffs. Yes, the impact they'll have, slow down a lot of exports, particularly for the high-end winemakers. Impact on consumers? It is interesting, and from our point of view, we deal with a lot of wine companies, a lot of consumers, a lot of wine shops right across the supply chain. Interesting that consumers are now expecting to see more of some of the uh, reds that may have been exported in the past in their bottle shops and maybe adapting their expectations and their behaviour that way and really getting that feedback. People are expecting to see more, particularly of the penfolds. How will that change what they buy? In terms of domestic consumption and the big reason why we're here today, uh, what will be the impact, the long-term impact of wine consumption in Australia from COVID? Uh, here's my big answer. We could possibly finish the call after this, not much. Um, and we will go into some of the disruptions that will happen up and down uh, in liquor shops with drinkers as well. But what we'll probably go back to is the trends and the trends themselves before COVID, during and after are very interesting as far as why people are changing what they drink, who's changing as well. And interesting that the the volume of wine in Australia uh, may be quite different from the number of people who are drinking it. A couple of things, and I think Robin particularly is going to talk about these as well. What are some of the changes which are going to impact uh, wine, particularly cellar, cellar door, as a result of COVID? A huge one is going to be the demographic change going out to the regions, people leaving Melbourne and Sydney particularly, 
moving further out, deciding they've had enough of the rat race, what will that mean? That has a range of impacts. It's going to mean harder to, to get staff there because they can't afford to rent around there. But for your customers out there, it's a huge change. You're going to have more of a local crowd. They're going to be more affluent. You're going to have to change your strategy to keep them and they're going to have more expectations like some of the high end local pubs in Australia. And the fact that a lot of the high land prices will hit around wineries means as well that the economics of a winery and a cellar door will have to change. And the last one before we get into some of the charts is sustainability. We could talk for a week about wineries and sustainability, that all purpose tag, everything it will mean to the consumer, particularly the millennial consumer, everything from being able to market on the carbon capture of the wine to the packaging, uh, to the changing where the wine is coming from. That will be a huge marketing point in what people choose to drink. Let's touch uh, just briefly on a few points. Uh, wine consumption in Australia, we still export about, uh, well, 60% of what we make, but that will go down with what's happening in China. The split across what people are drinking or what's made as well, it continues to be uh, majority white, but once again, that is changing as well as the softer reds come in. So what are consumers doing? How have they changed? It is intriguing to see and almost worrying, I would think, for some of the people on this call, the fact that the percentage of the population who are weekly wine drinkers is going down from 50% in 2010 by these stats, ABS stats, to 41% in 2019 to 38% in 2020. Um, look, uh, look around you. Uh, how many people do you know who aren't wine drinkers? It's fascinating to see those changes. And that's impacting a range of other agricultural foods and commodities as well. Also interesting is what consumers have done, and with this one we've gone from 2006 to June 2020 to June this year, what people are changing in terms of what they drink once every four week period. Uh, you could say that wine's resurgence, dipping down to pre or early COVID to now has been as a result of people drinking more in the second lockdown, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney. Beers had a slight uh, sort of a slight plateauing to do with craft beer. Interesting with spirits, and that's largely a marketing point. Australians, here's a stat for you, are apparently the biggest drinkers of independently made spirits uh, of any major country in the world, rather than the major change. A lot of that has to do with marketing. There have been some changes. This chart looks uh, perhaps more, more stronger than this, but there have been some changes through COVID in the amount of wine drunk. And, and we discuss this a lot in our economics team. Perhaps wine was drunk a fair bit at the start of COVID lockdowns. And then people got used to it. And then they got into being fitter or drinking a bit less. And then the second lockdown hit harder. But that's been one of the changes there. But will things go back to normal? And the last point is to break it down by age. And what this chart shows you is between March 19, uh, 2019 uh, and right at the start of COVID, March 2020, and then later on, where has the change been? Two fascinating changes in this one. The Gen Zs have actually drunk a bit less or consumed a bit less during COVID, apparently, according to the stats, and the Gen Xs have drunk a bit more. Being a Gen Xer, I'm going to put that down to two points, homeschooling. Um, and the need to drink more. And that may particularly have kicked in as things went on. But once again, will it slow down going forward? Uh, and the other big point, and I'm going to summarize this very briefly, but it's a very big point for a lot of particularly liquor retailers. What's been the change? People are drinking more of the over $30 wine, particularly going forward. There's one thing, and it's simplifying it as well. Why has this happened? It's aspirational. Uh, life is too short. People aren't going, or life is too short to drink cheap wine. People aren't going on a holiday, so they'll spend it on something else. But I'm told by a lot of people in the industry, particularly at the point of sale, that let's say tradies or people like me who live in a, let's say, an average suburb. Uh, are now being aspirational, working harder, thinking we, we enjoy the finer things. My local bottle shop in Heidelberg tells me they sell more $60 pinots to tradies than anybody else. And it is that change in society from people who are looking at those things in life. Finally, on, on retailers, it is interesting that when you look at Australian overall retail sales, uh, compared to liquor retailers, things surged at the start, probably like toilet paper, if we tracked it against this, whilst dining dipped. They levelled out in the middle, but they surged again in the second lockdown. 
I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go to one, three quick charts. We do work with all sorts of food. It's fascinating. And we track meat a lot, why people are eating less of one and more of the other. And here's to finish off two fascinating things that came out of comparing these. If you look at the, since 1975, the changes in meat consumption, chicken consumption has gone up almost at exactly the same rate as wine consumption. Why is that? I mean, it's, it's fascinating, but it's also could be very relevant. It's easier. Generations have changed. Could it be seen for health benefits as well? Both industries uh, will look at this and think, right, how do we capitalize on that? But also, how do we pay attention to the fact that things are plateauing at the end? and arrest that plateauing and make it grow. And for the very last slide, and, and Kate and Mark and Tom in my time, is this one. If the wine and chicken one look good, the beef and beer one looks equally bad for each other. Fascinating to see that for Australian consumers, as they eat less and less and less red meat, uh, it gets exported, so the beef producers don't mind, they drink less and less and less beer at exactly the same rate. Why is this happening? What can the wine industry learn from this so they make sure they don't go or you don't go down this path going forward and to capitalise going forward? That's my time up. Thank you very much. And I think I hand back to Mark. Excellent. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> that was uh, fascinating and very snappy. Well done. Thank you. Um, so moving right along, our next speaker is Robin Shaw. Um, some great bio notes on Robin as well. She's got a lot to bring here. She's the lead consultant at Wine Tourism Australia. Uh, that's a firm that specialises in helping wineries and wine regions maximise the tourism experience, the sales potential. She has an extensive background in the wine world, including management roles at the Australian Wine Club, the Jacobs Creek Visitor Centre, South Australian Tourism Commission, the Winemakers Federation of Australia and Adelaide Hills Wine. In 04, Robin received a prestigious Winston Churchill Fellowship to study global wine tourism innovation, after which she developed a suite of industry resources, including the Australian Wine Tourism Toolkit. Today, she runs Salador and Direct to Consumer Performance Improvement Programs for Australian wineries. And this entails a comprehensive Salador and digital audit, direct consultation and team training, along with an international wine tourism study tour program excellent alignment with what we're looking at today. In 2021, Robin joined the University of Adelaide Wine Business Team to develop and deliver the Wine Tourism Program for postgraduate students and has been invited to represent Oceania, Oceania for the newly formed Global Wine Tourism Organisation. Thank you, Robin, and over to you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, sorry, Mark, <laughs> just been listening to Michael. Uh, let me just share my screen here and we'll get going since I know there is a uh, time frame here. Uh, thank you for letting me be part of this uh, fantastic uh, webinar today. It's wonderful to be able to share some insights uh, into what's happening. And of course, we are all looking forward to getting back out to the regions and potentially overseas as well. Uh, before I begin, I think uh, thinking back to last year when COVID hit and wineries across the country were faced with lockdowns, and wondering what on earth they could do, or if not necessarily lockdowns, certainly for restrictions placed on their premises when it came to how many people they could have in, how many square metres they could use, whether people could sit down or stand up. And I think COVID actually gave us a gift or gave us a wine tourism gift from my perspective. Uh, and there were three things that, that happened that I think have been uh, uh, very good for us as an industry. The first was, that because we had to uh, serve wine seated, people moved very quickly to seated tastings. This is something that uh, I've been talking about for several years and has been a, a fantastic um, initiative in the, in the US where people actually, seated tastings uh, allow people to engage longer and spend more money. So I thought that was a really good uh, thing that happened. It also meant we started charging for tastings. And this has been a real problem in many areas in Australia, this idea that we would uh, dare to charge people for uh, consuming our product and sampling on site. So people quickly moved to a, uh, a charging for tastings regime. And of course, because people needed to know how many visitors were going to be coming into the premises across the day, bookability became important as well. So we saw charging for tastings, seated tastings uh, and enhanced experiences, 
and bookability. So three great things I think that have come out of uh, the COVID situation. Uh, I, I know we haven't got a lot of, lot of time to go through all these slides, so let me get started. I've, uh, I've, I'm looking at this from uh, four perspectives, attracting visitors, retaining them, uh, sorry, converting them into customers, retaining them, and of course, sustaining your business into the long term. So the first uh, area is, of course, attracting visitors to our cellar doors. Before we do that, we need to understand some of the global travel trends and visitor motivations. So things that are happening in the broader world. And there's a, a major worldwide trend towards uh, some of these areas that I've got on the screen. So slow travel, which, uh, which means that people want to get away to regions and destinations and really just slow down. None of this uh, buzzing by and just taking photos. Responsible travel is also, and sustainability, which go hand in hand, is also a major travel motivator for people. And we're not talking greenwashing here. We're talking where people actually want to demonstrate that they are responsible travellers and they will support businesses that are also being responsible when it comes to caring about our environments and our communities. New luxury and escapism are also key areas. And when we talk about luxury, we're not talking about six star hotels. We're talking about uh, engagement at a, at a really um, a base level. So sitting with the winemaker up on top of the hill overlooking the vineyard and hearing the stories about how they came to be a winemaker. Uh, Multi-generational travel is also something that uh, we're seeing occurring around the world in higher numbers. And that means uh, the grandparents, the parents and the children all choosing to travel. And a subset of that is uh, female travellers who tend to hold the purse strings, make the travel decisions and also want to travel together as groups. Transformative travel is, uh, is a really big area and I could actually spend an hour just talking about this area. Transformative travel is where people actually want to uh, go to a destination, have an experience that actually has an effect on their lives at a personal level. So we're seeing that people, it's, it's not just about uh, having a great time, that's certainly one of the things people are looking for, but it's also how can they uh, create a deeper meaning from the experiences when they travel. Cultural travel in terms of Indigenous travel and unlocking what uh, really makes a place tick is also uh, on the rise along with food travel. And when we say food travel, if we think about uh, the broad definition of food or culinary, it includes wine and it includes all the beverages as well. Health and wellbeing or wellness as it's often called is also another major trend as is uh, the idea to reconnect both with people, uh, families, friends who have been separated for so long uh, and of course with nature. Experiential travel is great for us because it is all about uh, having experiences that are immersive and entertaining. Uh, indulgence is uh, important as is value. So it's, uh, it doesn't have to be cheap, but it does have to be of value to people, it has to represent value, whatever experiences they're, they're out to uh, purchase. And authenticity, it's last on the list there, but it's probably the most important thing. So when you look to create uh, products and services that are appealing, there's a few things to think about, especially as we reopen. One of the first things I encourage people to do is to undertake a gap analysis. What's actually missing in your region that people may want? Uh, also have a look at your competitors. Things have changed. Some places don't exist anymore or they've had to change what they do and when they do it. So have a look. It may not, the, the landscape may not be exactly as it was before the whole COVID uh, lockdowns occurred. Then think about designing experiences around a specific target market. This really means getting, getting specific about who that target market is. Michael uh, made mention of some of the demographic shifts that uh, people uh, moving from the cities out to the regions. And this certainly has its pros and cons. It does mean that we'll have uh, more affluent people with their city ideas and their habits coming out to the regions. Motivations have also changed. With the first uh, uh, lockdown, once, once people, and I'm, I'm sort of looking at uh, South Australia originally, when people came out of lockdown and went out to the cellar doors, uh, it was very interesting to hear the feedback. People were not interested necessarily in engaging with the people in the cellar door. They were much, much more interested in engaging with each other. They had a lot to catch up on. And as New South Wales and Victoria reopen now, that's going to be very important to understand. It's not necessarily just about uh, the wine or the experience with the people at the winery. First up, they need to uh, reconnect with each other at a social level. 
think about developing a suite of experiences that are actually at different price points too. So as you're thinking through the target markets, uh, think about what could be appealing for somebody on a day visit versus five days in a region and consider seasonality as well. If you know that people go to the beach nearby in summer, then think about what you could be offering that is uh, potentially going to bring people out to the region when they can't actually go to the beach that day. So think about ways that uh, you can incorporate those things. And of course, identify all the different touch points. So those ways in which people engage with your brand and with your, uh, with your wine along the, the entire customer journey and enhance that visibility and messaging in all spaces. Also keep your information up to date and make it really easy for people to book. It's, uh, we know things change, everybody knows things uh, may, may be different next week to what they are this week. So make sure that messaging is clear across uh, all, the, all, the, all the channels. The second area is conversion. Once we get them to the cellar door, obviously it's our jobs to convert them into loyal long-term customers. And this means buying wine. That's, uh, that's the business that we're all in. Ensure that, uh, think about the destination appeal. What, what is really appealing about uh, your destination and your cellar door? What is your unique value proposition? What is it that makes you different and memorable and stands out from everybody else? These are the things you want to focus on. Obviously ensure that website and socials accurately reflect that as well. And take this time to actually tidy up your backstage factors, as I call them. These are all the things that Consider you are a guest at your own property and have a really good look around. What are those in arrival impressions? Is everything fresh? Is everything really reflecting your brand well? Think about all those things and uh, put some effort into uh, enhancing as you need to. The critical part is if you're going to convert people to buying your wine and into long-term loyal customers, uh, it takes people to do that. And that is your frontline team. And I know from talking to clients all over the country in the last two years that uh, our teams have been decimated. It's been a really sad state of affairs where teams have been stood down and we've lost a lot of people from the industry as well, which is quite unfortunate. This is a good opportunity, of course, to review your job descriptions and really look at who's on your team and what you're expecting them to do. I often see advertisements for people working in a cellar door who also have a working uh, knowledge of MYOB and are expected to do the accounts. Those two skills don't really go hand in hand. So have a really good look at uh, what you are expecting of people, especially as we've been enhancing our direct to consumer sales side of the business, along with our cellar door experiences and often trying to uh, marry those two jobs together. Evaluate your team's skills on a regular basis, make them feel valued by actually getting in and finding out what it is that they do know, what it is that they don't know, develop a training program across a regular basis. Some of this should be done in-house. This is product knowledge, et cetera. And some of it should potentially be done by outside uh, uh, training professionals. And think about ways where you can provide regular incentives and feedback, especially if they meet uh, your, your teams meet KPIs. And I would encourage you to share your, uh, your targets with your teams on a regular basis too. The third area is retained. So once we get these valuable customers uh, in the door, visitors in the door, we want to keep them for the long term. So think now about how to review your post-visit engagement strategies. So think about what is your process for identifying, qualifying and communicating with the different people who visit your cellar door. So this is your first time and repeat customers and visitors, your club members, people who come for events. Streamline those processes for joining mailing lists, uh, loyalty programs, and of course, placing orders. There's a lot of technology these days that we can uh, utilize to do that. Develop an annual touch point calendar to maintain communication as well. So think seasonally, all the different things that happen across the season, uh, when vintage occurs, when your new releases come out, and create a program that, of communication around that. Personalization is also a key buzzword for the future. And personalization occurs in all areas of life uh, and all retail um, transactions as well. So think personalization. Think about sharing your stories on a regular basis uh, as well. Uh, these are the stories that, you know, sometimes they're, they're fantastic, happy stories. Sometimes they're a bit more uh, mellow, depending on what's happening. Share them anyway. It's about being authentic and really communicating who you are and what's different and memorable about you. 
consider also whether you should uh, communicate via SMS if people want to be communicated with that way, chat on your website, uh, short videos are great on social channels, something that's done on your phone is perfect, it doesn't have to be uh, fully curated. And don't forget to pick up the phone occasionally and actually talk to your customers. This was a really big deal, uh, certainly through the, the first phases of lockdowns. People were happy to talk to somebody. They were all at home anyway, so it was, they were quite happy to pick up the phone and talk to their favourite winemaker. And don't discard old-fashioned snail mail. If people actually still have a post office box or a letterbox, um, you'll be one of the few people actually sending out something uh, interesting, entertaining and, uh, and, and worth reading. And of course, remember data is king. You wanna be collecting data at every possible touch point you can, whether that's online or in the cellar door, recording it and doing something with it, which is the most important piece. And finally, we have uh, sustain. So once we've done all this good work and we've got our customers and we've uh, got our plans in place and our very well-trained teams, we wanna keep this going for the long term. Of course, we can't control everything. So focus on what you can control and do it well. And then of course, in the back of your mind, plan for what you can't. And if there's anything we've learned in the last two years, there's a whole lot of things we haven't been able to control. So you do need to have those, those plans in place, whatever they may be, uh, to sustain throughout uh, whatever gets thrown at us next. Think about how you can diversify your D2C channels so that you've got uh, more than one way to communicate with people, more than one way to sell. And if you haven't yet ventured into the world of virtual events, uh, I encourage you to think about having a go. They're probably here to stay as a, a genuine avenue for uh, engagement and indeed for sales if you do it very well. And consider how you could invest in uh, the relevant software to support all of these activities in the long term. Find out ways that you can encourage and reward your loyal customers. They're the ones that are going to, who are stuck with you already and will be there for the long haul. And of course, avoid what the media are telling us is going is about to happen, which is this great resignation where everybody wants to quit their current job and change to something else. Invest in your people so that they will actually stay with you because they are your greatest asset. I have no idea how long that took, but thank you very much. Uh, from me and my colleague, uh, Tracy. Fantastic, thanks, Robin. That was, um, yeah, brain melting at times when I was sort of reflect on <laughs> a, a, lot of the different, a lot of the different wine businesses that we interact with, you know, some of that stuff that just seems so obvious, but is often done so poorly, like viewing things from the customer's point of view instead of for yourself, um, just focusing on, um, developing your people, making your environment a place that people want to work at. Exactly. Um, yeah, really excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Next, um, one of the other topics that we thought would be really good to include is um, all of the considerations around government support for all of the, the, the various programs that are out there. So we've got Sam Morris from SW joining us to give us an overview of, of those aspects and what's available. Uh, Sam is a director at SW and she's a tax and advisory specialist. She leads SW's national research and development tax and government incentives team. So she's all over this material. She also chairs SW's agribusiness industry group. She combines her commercial skills with a strong focus on supporting the unique challenges of Australian agriculture. She has clients across many different subsectors of agribusiness, including horticulture, wine, dairy, and meat processing, plus the supporting technologies and logistics. She works closely with clients and other advisors to deliver commercially focused strategies and solutions in an easy to understand and straightforward manner, focusing on growth and innovation. Um, thank you, Sam. Over to you. Thanks, Mark. So a bit, a bit of a change of pace, I guess now. Um, one of our firm's values is actually open doors and I couldn't think of anything more fitting at this time, um, both in terms of opening doors to renewed opportunities, but also really in the literal sense of, of your cellar doors now physically reopening, which um, has been a very long time coming. So I thought I'd focus my section on um, opportunities to tap into continued government support as, as you start to reopen um, those fantastic businesses of yours. 
So I thought I'd start with the Export Market Development Grant, which is the federal government's flagship grant program supporting exporters. Um, unlike most government incentives, the EMDG is what we would call an eligibility based program. And what this means is that if you're eligible and meet the criteria, you are then entitled effectively to funding. So it's not competitive in, in the usual way with, with some other programs as such, um, although there is a cap on funding allocated to the program. And for those of you familiar with the EMDG, um, you'll be aware that um, it's going through some significant change at the moment. So we're currently going through a transitional period and um, we're probably expecting there to be more changes um, that come about as, as the program evolves. Um, what you'd be used to is expenditure being effectively reimbursed after the end of the year. So for expenditure that's been incurred on eligible activities for export activities um, up until the 30th of June 2021, um, there is still time to claim under that reimbursement scheme. But what we're looking at for a lot of clients at the moment is, um, is moving forward to the um, what's really classed as a forward looking program from the 1st of July, where applicants will effectively um, be required to enter into a, a grant agreement, which will specify grant amounts per year. Um, so effectively, the, the idea behind that is to, um, to give a bit more certainty to applicants as to the amounts that will be um, effectively paid um, for eligible activities. Um, I'd say eligibility has probably remained fairly consistent with prior years. So if you've claimed in the past, you'll be familiar with that. Um, the new programme, however, has um, made it much easier for what are referred to as representative bodies to claim. So a representative body is basically a member based organisation. So where they're not directly exporting products themselves, but rather a promoter and advocate of members products. So, for example, um, regional wine associations would be in this category where they might undertake promotional activities for members. Um, and one, one of the um, key areas, I think, um, going forward is providing training activities for its members um, to help them become um, what's termed export ready, so um, new entries to the export market. Um, and there's some quite sizable um, grants available for representative bodies um, that can apply between two and three years with the grant funding up to 150,000 per year. Um, for regular exporters, um, just be aware that there are different tiers um, that have been introduced. So um, depending on your, um, your level of maturity around export, um, different levels of, of funding, which are, are much more tied into a tailored strategy and plan to market, where you'll need to be able to clearly articulate why you're applying for a particular level of support and importantly, being able to demonstrate that um, the activities you've um, performed during the year um, to, to meet your strategy have in fact been spent and been eligible. Um, important to note, 30th of November is the deadline for applications for the go forward, um, so that so the new regime. And um, there's no suggestion at this stage that that will be extended. So um, the idea is that applications will get assessed Grant agreements will be issued presumably around January um, to give um, applicants a bit more um, of a degree of certainty as early as possible as to what their entitlements will look like. So moving on to um, other types of grants and subsidies, um, these really do differ state to state. Um, federal programmes obviously are, um, are, are universal um, around each state and territory, but um, but many other um, grant opportunities are really based on your state or territory. And um, some can be accessed through councils as well. Um, probably fair to say that there's anywhere around 6,000 open funds at any one time. So it really can be a, a minefield to navigate um, what is available and importantly, whether you're eligible. I'd say a big health warning um, around you know, just the grant application process itself um, can be exceedingly time consuming. Um, 
the benefits are definitely not always worth the energy um, and distraction from other business activities. So I think I'd just advise to, um, to really pick what you're um, targeting um, as support quite carefully. And um, interestingly, I'd say some of the more COVID related programs um, are probably more easy to access that they've been developed more to, to try and pump some quick money into, um, into businesses rather than be too voluminous with paperwork. Um, we've seen um, Wine Australia's wine export grants of up to 25,000. Um, again, this is an expenditure reimbursement type program. Um, New South Wales, um, just wanted to mention, um, there's an export assistant grant, um, sorry, assistance grant of up to 10,000 um, that can actually be claimed alongside EMDG. Um, that might be an option for some smaller export expenditure, um, certainly over the last um, year or so, um, a, lot of, um, a lot of exporters have pulled back the, the expenditure. Um, for, for obvious reasons with COVID. So if the expenditure is you know, much lower, it might be more um, realistic to go for a smaller amount of, of up to 10,000 for a lot less effort than the um, quite complex EMDG process. Um, it's probably worth on, just on the COVID safe um, type things, probably worth checking with um, states and regions around um, funding that might be available for what I'd class as COVID safe plans. So that might be around additional cleaning requirements. It might be segregation of um, facilities such as toilets. I know that sounds crazy because you, you would imagine segregation of toilets in the first place, but um, just things like social distancing type measures. There's um, There's been a number of businesses that we've worked with where um, they've been compliant um, to um, pre-COVID regulations, but with additional um, social distancing requirements of need to revamp certain areas of their facilities. Um, and there have been some grants available for, for those. Um, so most states have offered some support for this, um, but as you'd expect, I think the, um, the hardest hit states being Victoria and New South Wales um, have, have been probably much more at the forefront. Um, from a tourism perspective, again, some specific support um, tends to be offered on a bit of an ad hoc basis. Um, and of course, EMDG, um, although we talk about export all the time with that, um, as it's in the name, um, does apply um, to inbound tourism when you're targeting overseas tourists. Now, obviously, that's been pretty challenging recently as well. Um, the Department of Agriculture has got, um, as administered by um, Wine Australia, um, a wine tourism and cellar door grant um, of up to 100,000. That's more targeted towards larger operations um, as you need, um, it's over 1.2 million in, in rebatable um, sales of wine. And um, that's really linked to the, um, the wine um, equalization tax reforms. And I just thought I'd um, touch on wage subsidies. Um, I guess as, as your businesses reopen and it, you know, um, both Michael and, um, and Robin touched on this around, I guess, refreshing and, and, and re, restarting from an employment perspective. Um, wage subsidies can be a good option to tap into um, where you're looking to increase permanent headcount. So, for example, Victoria's Jobs Fund, um, that provides two levels of wage subsidy, um, either a $10,000 or a $20,000 um, per um, full-time equivalent, depending on the um, categories of people that you employ. So there's a, there's a list of, of different categories from um, women over a certain age to um, to, to, to younger people, to indigenous, um, et cetera. Um, so, um, so that could be something to, uh, to, to just look out for because um, that's something that's fairly easy to apply for um, and can be quite readily evidenced um, as long as the job length meets the 12 month um, criteria. Um, 
I wouldn't be in tax without mentioning a couple of um, areas of government support in the tax world. Um, so we're seeing um, a significant tax depreciation benefit available for those wanting to invest in CapEx. Um, so, so for, for example, machinery, so depreciables. Um, the rules have changed a number of times through the various stages of COVID, um, but, um, but we, we still have the, um, the full temporary expensing rules, which means you basically can write off the full, um, the full expenditure on depreciables as long as those assets are, are held and, and ready, installed, ready for use by 30th of June 2022. So that's been extended out, which is great. Um, and also the lost carry back rules. So, so these, these came in really as a response to COVID and um, looking at businesses that have been over the last couple of years, loss making, um, presumably, um, you know, in, in a lot of areas, you know, focused around um, lack of trade, et cetera, et cetera, um, and being able to apply those losses to earlier profitable years. Whereas normally you have to wait and use them um, towards um, use them against future profits. So um, the the point there is it's not automatic. You need to claim that through your tax return. So get some advice around that, um, but that could really um, help with cash flow. And finally, I just wanted to touch on um, a couple of more what I class as operating business opportunities that we're seeing and, and assisting clients with. Um, Cost of energy is a big one. Um, a couple of times we've, we've mentioned around, um, you know, focus on renewables, around sustainability, um, particularly in the agri space, looking at um, and thinking about storage solutions, um, but really that broader theme of sustainability and accountability um, is really coming through pretty strongly. Um, there's often grants and incentives available for these types of things. And, and I expect that these will increase with renewed commitments to net zero that we're hearing about on a daily basis at the moment. Um, and you might also be aware that um, in Victoria, um, there is a, an energy certificate scheme, which is targeted at reductions in emissions. Um, they're increasingly valuable um, for those moving towards um, renewables in particular. Um, so if you're embarking on a renewable energy project, um, you know, let us know as we might be able to you know, guide you as to maximising the opportunity, um, reducing cost and ensuring your best place to, to access any funding or, or energy certificates. Um, so I guess in conclusion, I, I just wanted to say that it's, you know, um, in the excitement of reopening, um, don't forget to keep an eye on suitable support mechanisms. Um, but there is no such thing as free money. Um, you'll need to factor in um, your own financial contribution because usually these programs have um, a, a certainly a matched funding in, in some components. Um, time to apply and potentially ongoing reporting to satisfy government requirements. Um, that's all I, all I had. Hopefully I haven't run over. Um, back to Mark. Excellent. Thanks, Sam. There's some, yeah, really business critical content in there and a lot for business owners and managers to think about. Um, now, as we, we get to the question uh, section of this webinar, while you've got your microphone on, maybe we'll go to you first. Like, What sort of advice would you give to business owners and managers to help them sort of navigate all of that that subsidy kind of um, quag, not so much quagmire, that maze um, to help them avoid, you know, if you like the sort of Pyrrhic victories of going and spending $5,000 worth of their own time and money to pursue a, a rebate of, of $2,000. Yeah, I think, I think it's a good, a good question because um, I guess it's natural to think if something's available, you should go for it. Um, I, I always take the view that, you know, if it's, um, it, it's all about the, um, the burden as, as opposed to the reward. And um, if it's a very short form um, online application for $5,000, that's probably fine, can be done quickly, very little supporting evidence required. Um, but, um, you know, we sometimes get, you know, around, for example, ENDG, um, you know, organisations might have spent 20000 
Um, now, the, the complexities and amount of work involved in EMDG is just way too big for, for that to be um, something that you would pursue, um, where I was very open about, um, I guess, the, the options of you do it yourself um, if, if you want to, you know, and we'll give a bit of guidance or do it yourself and we'll review it or outsource it completely. Um, and, um, and obviously, you know, if, if you're outsourcing things, you're, you're naturally paying for services as well, um, which wouldn't be eligible for EMDG um, in its own right. It, it might be um, deductible elsewhere, but, um, but I think it's just making some sensible decisions around the amount of time and effort required um, for certain things. And, um, and, that's, and frankly, that's not always obvious from a program that's announced um, that you read about uh, you know, on the internet. Um, it sometimes looks a lot more straightforward than it is, or it looks a lot more complex than it actually is in reality. Yeah, okay, thanks for that. Um, we've had a couple of other ones come in for you, Michael, and um, if I can sort of try to combine these ones. Um, like to what extent are you, are you and your colleagues at the ANZ there seeing consumer behaviour putting more emphasis on what's around the experience rather than just what's in the bottle? And to what extent are these sorts of the, the behavioural shifts that you were describing sort of wine specific or are they part of you know, macro level, population level kind of changes? Thanks, Mark. Love a great question without notice. Um, absolutely. And, and we see that right across the food and beverage space um, in terms of the experience outside the bottle or outside the animal as well. Um, there are a, a few things in there. Consumers love the story. Um, for some reason, consumers love to know that the steak they're eating comes from Bessie and that Bessie lived a wonderful life on pasture. Don't know why, because I'm a farmer, but consumers love to know that. Similarly for wine, they would love to know where it came from, whether around Hillsville, in the Adelaide Hills, wherever, and details around it. So it's definitely part of that. And particularly for the export consumer, they want to be sure of it. So, so if that provenance is there, if it can absolutely be proven to be there, um, that, that's definitely part of it. And it, it's interesting when you break it down into which consumers like that and, and I was going to say how fickle they are, but how much they're likely to, to change what they're doing. And this ties back into what Robin was saying in a way, uh, once you've got them, how to keep them as well, uh, and almost how to ride the waves as they as they change their their tastes. Um, let, let me throw one wine stat into here of the million wine stats I used. Here's a million and one of the uh, the white varieties in Australia at the moment. Um, obviously, Chardonnay is still the biggest, and Pinot Gris. Um, the fastest growing one is Prosecco. Um, it's got a 31% compound annual growth rate over the past four years, um, and that is because it's been riding the wave of the uh, 20 to 30 young female who has um, uh, loves the thought of where it came from. It's been marketed very well. Um, it's by some of the major makers. They relate it back to where their wineries are and the cellar door and the experience. So it's that kind of thing. As, going back to where you started, it's the experience. It's what it, it adds to your identity. And Robin touched on um, a lot of this very well. And that's going to be a huge part of the marketing going forward. Yeah, OK. Thanks for that. And it was remiss of me not to remind our, our viewers, our attendees, either to keep an eye on the um, on the poll questions. So please, if you get if you get a chance, we're, we're still running for another few minutes, take a look at the poll questions and give us some feedback there. Um, Robin, we had a couple come through for you as well um, with our remaining time. But this is probably one around sort of benchmarking, if you like, or learning from over the fence. Like what, what are the best examples that you can think of that demonstrate the, the kinds of shifts in consumer engagement that our world of wine needs to adapt to and learn from? Like the best, best examples from fashion, cosmetic, sports teams, car brands. Um, what's, what has grabbed you? Yeah, good it's a, of how to do it better. <laughs> it's a good good question, uh, Mark. I think there's a lot we can learn from uh, online retail in particular. That's an area of major growth in the last year. I mean, anybody that's trying to order anything now for Christmas is in trouble. It might not arrive in time. 
uh, as people have been locked down, locked away, uh, they've they've been heading towards online ordering. And that can be a simple transactional experience, but the ones that are really successful are those that actually create a full consumer visitor experience once they get online. And yeah, I, I branched out and bought a number of things uh, over the last 12 months. Um, and I specifically wanted to look for some Australian brands, things that were made here, local businesses that I could support. And I was particularly, um, uh, I guess, uh, attracted to those ones that really told their story well, uh, whether it was a sustainable story or a family story. And then when things got interrupted, their production got interrupted because uh, their workers could no longer come in because they, they were locked at home, they'd send us a, an email and update us and tell us what was going on. So I felt really connected to a lot of these brands. So I think connection is one of the key things that we can do even when people can't come and visit us. So I think it's a really strong thing. And a lot of brands, I think, have been doing that really well. I'm not sure if that answers your question fully there, Mark. No, they're tough to answer fully. <laughs> it's hard to be too you know, case specific. Um, mm. Now, what about, I mean, another one that's come up in all around the world, as we understand it, is the, the difficulty with, staff retention in hospo to what extent like is there an opportunity there for the wine world to grab some of the best talent out of hospo and bring that in to sort of underpin or embellish that kind of customer experience um yeah i think that's uh, there's definitely an opportunity there uh, tourism and hospitality in particular have been very badly affected uh, across the globe and, of course, across Australia in the last uh, two years. So a lot of staff have had to look elsewhere. But these are people with some fantastic uh, front-of-house skills, some fantastic uh, experience skills. And often when I'm uh, uh, training people in cellar door service and sales, I say to take a leaf out of the six-star hospitality enterprises. You know, what is it that you can do that goes above and beyond uh, what, what would be expected? And often I use an example of uh, what a staff member told me who worked for uh, one of the Como Shambhala properties out somewhere like Vanuatu where they have those over-the-water um, accommodation villas that you know I really want to go to one day and at the crack of dawn the staff would be out there wading through the water literally picking looking for and picking up any kind of rubbish that they could see in the water so that the guests would never get to see any of that kind of thing you know it's just it was just an extraordinary story one tiny moment that I thought wow that is who thought that up and the staff thought it was they were happy to do it and, you know, it's just that example of really putting the customer first, really thinking about the visitor and really enhancing your brand and staying true to your, your brand's values, which in this case where we are a six-star property and you will see us at our best all the time. Yeah, delivering attention to detail. Mm. Um, I apologise to the couple of people who have shot through some really interesting questions just in the last couple of minutes, but we are running out of time. We've only got a couple of minutes to go. So I really have to throw back to Tom. We'll try to get back to you offline. Uh, thanks from me to all of our speakers and all of our colleagues, Tom and I, and our, our colleagues in our firms who've helped pull this to one together. Over to you, Tom, to wrap up. Thank you, Mark. Uh, before I go into wrap up, I'll just give an update on the poll. So we asked everybody what your top priorities were coming out of lockdown. Clear winner, unsurprisingly, was on-site uh, visits, given you've been closed for so long. Unsurprising, it's the number one. Uh, number two was wine tourism experience, and that certainly chimes with what Robin and Michael have been talking about throughout the session, and really is even spread amongst the rest of the questions. Um, Keep an eye on LinkedIn and our other socials. We'll be uh, we'll be socialising the response to that poll uh, in the next couple of weeks. In terms of uh, in terms of finalisation, I'd like to talk or I'd like to thank Mark for moderating. Thanks to Sam, Robin, Michael for the fantastic insights and contributions. 